Okay, hello and welcome for this year's first Silo AI webinar on machine learning for predictive maintenance. My name is Kai Knutila. I'm a lead AI solution strategist at the Silo AI, and I will be hosting today's webinar. Today we have uh, two brilliant speakers. First, we have Hanna Kronqvist, PhD senior data scientist at HIAP, and she will be telling us about uh, data science at the HIAP and Cargotech, and also about the predictive maintenance as a business journey. Hanna, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you, Kai. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. And our second speaker is uh, Slavomir Novacic, professor at Halmstad University, and also lead AI scientist at our very strong Silo AI Sweden team. Slavomir will be telling us about the explainable AI in predictive maintenance. Slavomir, it's a great to have you here with us. Thank you, it's great to be here. Okay, then a little bit about our agenda for today's webinar. Uh, I will first go through a little bit the introduction to Silo AI and, and a couple of examples that we have done for our customers in machine learning for predictive maintenance. And after that, Hanna will be talking about the predictive maintenance for smart and sustainable load handling. And after that, Slavomir will present ideas for explainable predictive maintenance. And at the end of the, our webinar, we will have a Q&A session. So please remember to submit some questions that arise when you when you see the text and uh, the presentations and and we will pick then a couple of those questions to q a session so that's our agenda so let's go let's go to the presentations first of all who we are silo ai is the largest private ai lab in the nordics uh, during the last little bit over three years we have grown to be over 120 ai experts and from those AI experts, we have over 60 with the PhDs. And why do we focus on finding these really strong AI talents? It's because AI as a technology is moving forward really, really fast. And having AI expertise from few years past just simply is not enough. And that's, our, that's one of our methods, how we stay on top of our game. And we have very strong presence here in Nordics. We have in Finland sites in Helsinki, Turku, Oulu, and we are also now ramping up also in Tampere, where I am located. But we also have, like mentioned, very strong team in Stockholm, Sweden, and we are also building up a team in Copenhagen, Denmark. And our this year's target is to push more to Europe, and we are really aiming to be the leading AI flagship company of Europe this year. And this is what we do. This is where our expertise lies. So our AI experts work on machine learning to extract value out of vast complex combination of data. They work on computer vision to augment human intelligence through video and picture-based AI solutions. They also work on natural language processing, which extracts information from speech and text. So on these three topics, mainly our AI scientists and AI engineers work on. But we also do software, and of course these AI solutions are software also, but we do software around them so that they can be seamlessly integrated into our customers' uh, solutions and products. So we do software and data engineering for end-to-end -end development. And how do we operate? We are in a service and consultation business. So in a nutshell, we provide AI experts as extensions for our customers' in-house teams 
R&D or product or service uh, development teams. And we can also do complete turnkey deliveries for customers if they choose that way to work. And, and we are very flexible how, we, how the kind of customer wants us to be supporting us. Uh, okay, sorry about that. And uh, during these little bit over three years, we have been building over 100 uh, productized AI projects, uh, which, which kind of gives us a very strong basis for building new AI solutions. And of course, we have a lot of tools and platforms built around this AI development. And if our customers choose it so, and, and they decide that they want to use the same tools, we can also customize these AI development tools for them. And that's what the customizable solutions means here. Okay. And where do we do this AI solution is this uh, next slide. And, and here we can see the focus segments that we work on. So we do AI solutions for smart industries and, and vehicles. We do smart devices and networks, smart cities and citizens. So pretty wide, wide focus. And on this slide, it's even more kind of better to see how widely we have done AI solutions for our customers. So here are different use cases from, from these di different focus segments that we have. And everything that you see on this slide is uh, something that we have done for our customers. So these are real AI solutions. And, and many of these, and many of these go, go under the topic of uh, today's webinar, which is a predictive maintenance. So for instance, in smart vehicles, we have done predictive aircraft maintenance. And for smart industries, we have done uh, process quality prediction and also visual quality control and visual anomaly detection, which are kind of uh, uh, process industries, uh, good ways to predict uh, uh, the kind of maintenance need. And also in smart cities, we have done water quality and sewage pipe analysis, which is for city infrastructure, uh, important predictive maintenance uh, possibilities. So I have still a couple of slides here where just highlighting a couple of use cases we have done. So this one is a machine learning for predictive maintenance that we have done for major European airline client of ours. And what we did here was a machine learning based solution, learning complex patterns from sensor data and finding early signals to reveal upcoming failures. So really a nice example of machine learning for, for predictive maintenance. The next example is for major European glass producer, where we have created a computer vision solution for them uh, to identify anomalies in uh, heat patterns of glass. So nice example how uh, computer vision can help the human quality controller to understand the process needs. And my final example is from the city of Helsinki, for whom we did this kind of uh, predictive maintenance uh, solution for pipe networks. City of Helsinki has over 3000 kilometer long pipe network. And what we did was a, a solution that predict possible blockages and, and helps city of Helsinki to prevent those blockages. And this has been a nice example how predictive maintenance is valid point also in, in city infrastructure work. And that was my final slide. And now it's time to give floor to our uh, great speakers. First is Hanna. Hanna, stage is yours. Thank you, Kai. Paulina, may we get, please go to the first first slide? Thank you. Uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I cannot see the screen. I think right your now. slides are available. All right, great. Um, yeah, now, now, you, now, now they can be seen. Sorry about that. No worries. Thank you. Um, so yes, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good day to uh, all of the Scandinavians. And good morning and evening to anybody tuning in from elsewhere. Um, hello from Helsinki Carbotech HQ. Um, my name is Anna Grönqvist, Senior Data Scientist at HiYab, part of Cargotech Group. Um, I have uh, actually been recommended that I should always, in these kinds of settings, be introducing myself uh, as Dr. Grönqvist, but then I have found that algorithms do mistake me for a man, so I have uh, stop doing that. We can stick with Hannah for now. Um, Paulina, thank you. So the organizers asked me to tell you a little bit about myself and uh, in particular what it is that brings me to be talking to you today. So I was thinking that I would start that story with um, early adulthood, although you might argue that Actually, maybe the scientist's uh, journey starts earlier. When I was a child and went to first grade uh, in maths class, I, uh, the teacher gave me three books so that I would be busy while, uh, while they went through the normal curriculum with the other children. But if that already doesn't label you for life, then maybe uh, when going as an early adult voluntarily to spend uh, summer uh, to do a summer program uh, in Russia for aerospace physics uh, called Talented Children, then uh, at least uh, your friends will never stop making fun of you. But maybe the, the one spark that made me want to really become a scientist was uh, the chance I got to go to CERN in 2005. Uh, when the Large Hadron Collider was being built at this European Centre for Particle Physics Research. So from there on, I went on to study theoretical physics at the University of Helsinki and returned to CERN as an intern a few years later. Uh, and from there, uh, got a first publication, first talk abroad, and then went on to uh, finish my master's in Paris at uh, ONS and then uh, contrary to plan I stayed in Paris and I did a PhD um, at the French Atomic Energy Commission on the topic of mathematical modeling for, for high energy particle collisions. Um, after that I still stayed abroad and I joined a nanotech software startup company from where I then returned to Finland early 2018 to start working at Cargotech, then at the corporate uh, side in the CIO office, data-driven services team, uh, from where I then moved to HIAB, uh, one of Cargotech's business areas after last summer, and I'm now working there as a senior data scientist. And uh, some of the things that I've learned along the way have been teaching. Uh, on the side quite a few years and uh, a very beneficial uh, side product of all of this was to become quadrilingual. So that's very helpful when you're working at a global company. Paulina, can we go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So one of the questions I get quite a lot is, uh, what on earth is a particle physicist doing at a global logistics company that's uh, been focused on uh, building heavy machinery uh, from steel and that use oil. Um, so what I, what I read in between the lines when I hear that question is, is a bit of a mis misunderstanding about the role of science in society today. And on this slide, I, uh, I wanted to, to show you some of the megatrends that are shaping the world and society around us. And, we have um, sustainability, urbanization, 
uh, digitalization, electrification, uh, population growth, also consumption growth. Cargo flow is not going anywhere uh, anytime soon. And shortage of operators to, to operate the equipment that we manufacture. Um, so the real question in my mind is then, how does a traditional company having made, made this heavy machinery, how, how does that kind of a company stay relevant in this changing world? And for me, well, as a scientist, uh, I think the answer is science. So with science and in particular with data science, we have uh, the means and the power of confronting this societal change around us and also overcoming I think the challenges uh, that the changes bring along. So Paulina, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So just to say a few words more about the values and the mega trends, talking about sustainability, which of course is way more than just a mega trend. For me personally, it was one of the main reasons for joining the Cargotech group just over three years ago. Um, on the slide here in the middle is a figure that represents the annual waste in uh, cargo flow that goes to moving only empty loads. So imagine that as a data scientist working on improving inefficiencies and optimizing the cargo flow, just um, even improving this figure by a little bit uh, can give you some serious purpose in life, I think. But thank you, Pauline. I can go to the next slide. All right, so, um, so far talking mostly about the value drivers and why it is that we do science and why science is relevant in a business setting. Uh, there might be those among you, um, as one of my colleagues who cites his favorite movie sometimes and tells me, well, show me the money. So uh, talking about data in the manufacturing sector and it's worth what is known from studies is that in the manufacturing sector, 99% of the value in data is not used and combine that with the knowledge that if you were to invest and dig a bit deeper you'd get more than 10 times your money back so data science in traditional business uh, has the potential of being extremely profitable thank you paulina if we go to the next slide all right so how does uh Hayab get into the picture. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Hayab is part of the Cargotech group. Uh, Cargotech as a group is a cargo, cargo solutions provider uh, globally, whether it be for solutions and equipment that operate on, at, the, at sea or in ports and terminals or on land. So those are the business areas McGregor, Kalmar, and Hayab. And on this one slide, uh, trying here just to give you a crash course into what Hayab is as a business. Um, on the left hand side, we have uh, our tail lift, uh, a picture of that. Then in the middle, we have a truck mounted forklift. And then top right, multi lift, and bottom right, a loader crane, which is the most complex uh, product we make. And um, on the bottom left, we have some of the key figures from last year. So oh, just over 3 billion in sales group wide and 11 and a half thousand employees currently. And may we go to the next slide, please, Paulina? Thank you. Um, so from this crash course on the previous slide, uh, you may have, have noticed that 
the majority of high up equipment go on trucks. So when we talk in a data science forum about um, about high up as a business, uh, I wanted to talk about what happens going beyond the hydraulics part and going beyond the uh, heavy duty machinery part. Um, high up, by the way, uh, as a name stands for Hydraulics Industry Corporation. Um, but yes, so coming back to the slide, um, most of our equipment, practically all of it, go on trucks. So we are heavily bound uh, by the advances of the automotive industry and also, of course, following that. So the change in the trucking industry has been seen for quite some time at Hayab for the past 10 years or so. There have been uh, heavy investments into connectivity and into IoT, which uh, makes the data scientists working here today uh, very lucky because we're in the position where we uh, have uh, an IoT cloud up and running and we have huge data assets to work with and we can actually uh, get our hands dirty and build some wonderful solutions. And those solutions are, some of them are mentioned on the next slide. So if we may go there, please, Paulina. Thank you. Um, in particular, this past year, I guess, um, connectivity has become ever more important. And talking about high uh, equipment as being mounted on trucks for already some time now, and I, the next speaker, Slavomir, you are uh, particularly an expert uh, on the automotive side. The, with connectivity also then on our side, this allows our customers to get an, an overview of their business critical assets. So 360 plus 360, for the truck and the other equipment on. So what we're talking about in practice here for, um, for data-driven solutions is remote services. We are talking about predictive maintenance in particular in this webinar, also about the optimization of fleet and equipment performance, autonomy, and then some very cool stuff, virtual reality, simulator trainings, uh, and sustainability and safety reporting. And to talk about the people who are uh, partly at least making this happen, we could go to the next slide. I am saying partly because this is an organizational uh, challenge, but I'll get back to that. Uh, I wanted to just take a, take a moment to talk about our data science capabilities at HIAB and the Carbotech Group. We are currently some, some 20 uh, experts working uh, on, on the different, different solutions and for the different business areas, and me in particular for HIAB. We have senior data scientists uh, and data scientists, PhD students, aspiring data scientists, trainees, uh, master student, data engineer, and we're also partnering um, to get more competencies into the team. And as a silo, we have um, quite a big fraction of PhDs uh, in our team. We have, I think everybody has a PhD from a slightly different uh, area than the others, so that's wonderful. We complement each other. And uh, as a heads up, uh, we are recruiting currently, so you might want to check out uh, carbotech.com slash careers to get some more information. But for me, uh, at least, this is also part of uh, a company being sustainable. Uh, you are also investing into, into educating and bringing up the next generation of, of um, tech-oriented people to, to change the world. 
But then if we go to the predictive maintenance uh, part, please. Um, what I wanted to, to talk about when it comes to predictive maintenance is that, at least in the, in the data community, often, often we talk about the technological part and, and the algorithms and, and the data itself. But uh, from an organizational perspective, it is way more. But talking about the capabilities and, and, and the technological steps that we need to take uh, on this journey that I'm calling it here is going from corrective maintenance, by which we mean fixing something that's already broken, to preventive, which is having, having schedules uh, and maintenance that is kind of one size fits all. And then to the next step, which is predictive maintenance, no longer one size fits all, but actually tailor made solutions to fit your operational circumstances. And even further to the prescriptive maintenance, which is not only is the scheduling uh, custom made for, for your operations, you also get the actual repair kit to um, fix the problem when and if and when it arrives. Um, but if we can go to the next slide, please, Paulina. Thank you. So, um, before I said that the data team was partly what was building uh, the digital portfolio and the data science team is also only partly what is the people that are bringing about uh, the predictive maintenance business journey in this kind of an organization. Um, what, what we've seen concretely so far is that it is about so much more than the algorithms. It, it is actually a big uh, change management exercise and it is um, harnessing the power of this uh, red pyramid here on the slide of, of getting data to become wisdom through information and knowledge and uh, working at a global corporation of this many people uh, often parts parts of the information parts of the knowledge are in different parts of the organization and uh, and just going the steps of of the tech uh, would not be giving you the entire picture of predictive maintenance um, some of the lessons learned, if we go to the next slide, is just about this. So what we see predictive maintenance as being um, is very much a cultural challenge. Uh, Hayab's a 75-year-old company with really uh, a long history, rich traditions. We are moving away from an equipment-centric viewpoint to a holistic viewpoint where we uh, are really helping our customers in all possible ways surrounding the equipment. Um, predictive maintenance at, this, at, a, uh, at a global corporation is also a complex exercise. Uh, I mentioned that we are very lucky in the ample data assets that we have, but we also have complex data landscape uh, to manage and to master. And uh, thirdly, uh, predictive maintenance is very much uh, a people, uh, a people transformation and not just a, an algorithmic task. Um, the data scientists and the entire ecosystem around uh, spend a lot of time on stakeholder alignment and communication. Uh, and getting everybody on the same page is just essential for making the steps uh, up in the stairway. So thank you very much for, for inviting me to speak uh, on behalf of the team and on behalf of the organization. But I just want to emphasize that this is very much a team effort. And uh, yeah, so thank you.
Okay. Thank you, Anna. It is heartwarming to see that the high up and cargo tech are taking sustainability with such a concrete targets and, and examples and, and kind of steps forward. And, and in the middle of that is data science and, and super talents like you working on that. It really looks to me that uh, you, you're going to make a great success out of that. Thank you, Anna. And then is time for our next speaker. Maybe before I give give floor to Slavomir, reminder that please do send questions through the through the webinar tool so that uh, we get nice questions at the Q and A session. But okay, now it's time for Slavomir. Stage is yours. Thank you very much. Let me figure out the sharing. So for some reason, I think you don't see my PowerPoint yet. No. It seems to have crashed, so hopefully now. I can see it now. Now it's good. It works better. Okay, great. Yes. Uh, so sorry for the delay, but it always happens. Uh, works perfectly in trying and not in real life. So let me talk a little bit about the more technical side of uh, predictive maintenance and especially kind of a little bit of a picture of what happens right now and also a little bit about where we are moving. So I will talk about explainable artificial intelligence for predictive maintenance. So obviously predictive maintenance as we've heard is about figuring out the condition of the equipment, figuring out when to do maintenance so that you can optimize the costs and you can look at the asset condition and different uh, kind of stages of life. And then the, if you look at the really successful examples of predictive maintenance, I feel like there are two extremes. On one extreme, you have very complex equipment like the nuclear reactors or airplanes. And on the other, you have very simple one, especially wheel bearings. And it turns out that the trick to the left-hand side is when you look at really critical expensive equipment, you have lots of high quality data. An airplane will generate 20 terabytes of data per flight. You know exactly what's happening, and it's reasonably easy to figure out, okay, is everything going as it should, or are there any issues that, that require attention? And on the other side, you have the simple equipment when you have very well understood processes. You know exactly what can go wrong, what will be the symptoms of things going wrong, and so on. Now, that a lot of really interesting things, unfortunately, happen somewhere in the middle. There is very few reactors in the world and the wheel bearings are very, very simple. So when you imagine things like trucks, it gets a lot more complicated. And I have been working a lot with Volvo, for example, trying to figure out how do you take some of those successful ideas and use them on equipment which is reasonably complex, but also has limited amount of information that is being collected. And of course, trucks is not the only example. If you look at energy, healthcare, it's all the same types of problems. And basically, when you look at the predictive maintenance, there are two main ways in which you can approach it. So one is when you look at the system which automates human decisions. So you look at past repairs, you try to figure out what is relevant sensor data, and you try to do failure prediction. So you have equipment, whatever equipment it would be, it generates some data, it has some failures, and you basically look at the data before those failures, can be sensor readings, fault codes, whatever else. You look at some other data, which is unrelated to failures, and you try to find differences. And then the other uh, kind of more forward looking way is to, to look what we call self monitoring. So kind of a system which understands its own operation. So a system where you look at unfiltered sensor data, and you basically try to identify deviations. You start to figure out when something strange happens. 
and only those strange things you try to match against past information that you might have. So one way of looking at it is if you imagine some reference group data, let's say a fleet of buses, and then those buses will generate some data, some kind of information. And what you try to do is you try to build models of typical behavior. What typically happens with those vehicles? And those models can be very simple, just simple histograms, but they also can be very, very complicated, like neural networks and so on. And when you have those typical behaviors, then you can measure what is the expected variability within a peer group. So among equipment which is supposed to be behaving the same, it's built the same, it should uh, operate the same, you are trying to figure out what is the normal variability versus what indicates an issue. So then you can build this kind of deviation level over time, evolution, and so on. And, and basically the main reason for doing that is when you think of predictive maintenance, more than just trying to make predictions about next failure, when you are trying to look at it as some kind of a knowledge creation, where you look for some deeper understanding, like what are the degradation patterns? Can you learn it? What are the usage patterns? How do you know how customers are using the equipment? What are the different effects of external conditions that you couldn't really predict just from the from the lab. So what you basically would like to do is you would like to use predictive maintenance in order to design better equipment in the future. If you know what's wrong with your current designs, you can actually improve upon that. But that part is, is a little bit harder. So this is where there is a need for explainable AI. So let me talk a little bit about what explainable AI is and how it works. So Everybody has heard about explainable AI. You basically cannot open a newspaper anymore without, uh, without hearing something about it. But it's tricky to really put a, a concrete idea of what, what that means. And, and obviously, we talk a lot about black box AI and then how they are wrong and, and bad and we need to get away from them. But the, the question is, what are actually the benefits and, and what are the techniques we could be using here? So one way of looking at it is if we look at the explainability and interpretability of, of systems, we have a lot of different AI or machine learning methods we could be using, anything from simple decision trees to very, very complex uh, deep neural networks. Uh, and it is kind of tempting to put them uh, on, on those two axes of prediction accuracy versus uh, explainability. I mean, this slide comes mostly from, from DARPA, uh, so so it's it's a lot of people who kind of buy into into this idea. And then if you have this this notion, then you can basically say, okay, explainable AI is a way of increasing the explainability without lowering the accuracy. So you don't want to be doing the trade-off between the two, but you just want to keep the existing accuracy or performance of the models and instead increase their explainability. But the challenge is that the way we are looking at it right now, we are actually not so much talking about explainability, but just about complexity. We are just saying, well, we are good at understanding simple things, but as soon as the AI gets complex, we stop being able to, to understand it. Uh, and, and I think there is a challenge with mixing those two terms, because I don't believe that it's inherently that we are incapable of understanding complex things. We are pretty good at understanding many different complex phenomena, but in AI, we still have to do this in a, in a better way. Now, obviously, there are certain issues with, uh, with the AI. I mean, you have all heard about those examples of uh, adversarial attacks on network, which are very easy to fool uh, with some tricky information and so on. You have all seen those examples of uh, AI systems like IBM Watson, doing great things in simple settings, for example, the, uh, the Jeopardy winning, but then the same systems when they are supposedly moved to real applications, they actually fail to deliver. Right? The, the goal behind IBM Watson was, for example, to do medical recommendations. Turns out it's really tricky. Uh, Amazon had a very uh, famous failure with the sexist uh, hiring AI. Uh, the Google flu trends, which were very good predictors for flu, have stopped working after some time. Uh, there are many cases, especially in the medical domain, but not only, 
when the AI systems which work very well in the lab are basically making dangerous recommendations when deployed in the real world. Uh, and that's something that, that we really need to, need to think about. So basically what we are facing right now in many situations is we have all of those AI systems and they seem to be working very, very well. But then you go, you try to deploy it, you go to the end user and the end user starts asking, okay, but how do I know that I can trust this system? And many people are sell, selling the explainable AI as a solution to this problem, basically saying, well, so we have this black box AI, and now we will give you the uh, magnifying glass, which will let you inspect it. And then you will be able to figure out that you actually should trust it. But I'm a little bit uncertain if that's really the, the direction, because if I'm buying a car, I don't want the salesman to give me a screwdriver and say, okay, you can uh, look at how it's built, and then you will know that it will work the right way. Uh, and the explanations for the decisions is not really the, the thing that we are going for. So, so there is a lot of challenges in how we are actually facing those, uh, those issues and so on. And to me, one of the things that this reminds me of is, is those kinds of pictures. I mean, I'm sure most of you have seen it before in the context of uh, programming and software engineering, which is basically the mismatch between what is done technically and what it was actually intended, what was needed, and so on. So this kind of a picture in my mind fits today quite well into the AI as well. And we can argue whether the software engineering is still facing those issues or if they have basically figured it out, but at least they have figured some of those things. And I think AI is to a large degree uh, in the same kind of stage of the, uh, of the maturity journey. So AI is, is one of the most sexy jobs you could have right now. So basically you have all of those young, bright minds who come and they want to be data scientists, they want to be AI researchers and so on. And they look at it as a puzzle, as an engineering puzzle, a mathematical puzzle. And basically they try to see, okay, how can I solve this problem while showing how smart I am? Uh, and this goes back, like if you go far, far back in, into things like uh, assembled programming and so on, you see very, very similar things, like how can you express your, the, the intelligence, the, the smartness through the solution? And then the problem is when you face real world complexities, the uniform specifications, changing requirements, the, the maintainability of things and so on, this, this actually doesn't quite work. So I think we have some work in how do we go from uh, AI and kind of lab setting into the actual real world. And I think one very important aspect of it is there is no question that the AI is taking over the world. Maybe all, not all of the world, but at least a lot of it. Like there is a lot of things which we used to say that only humans can do it. And it turns out, no, actually computers are at least as good at it as, uh, as, as we are. But one way of looking at it is if we think of the spectrum between kind of helping humans and fully autonomous AI, I think the key to explainable AI is to focus on the left-hand side of it. When we are talking about autonomous AI, an AI which solves the problem completely and doesn't need to uh, interact with, uh, with the human, that's not really where explainability will shine. The explainability will shine when you have AI and humans working together. And this is where the most important things, as, as Anna said, uh, are actually happening right now and the most the biggest benefits are to be gained. So for, for that to happen, we kind of need to understand what is the relation between AI and, uh, and humans. And one way of looking at it is, in some settings, AI is weaker than humans. So then explainability is basically about finding errors and we want to improve the machines. And this is where most of today's AI is, is done. Then we have the setting where the AI is about as good as humans. So we want to kind of build trust. And finally, we have those settings where AI is stronger than humans. Uh, and basically we want to learn from the AI. Uh, we want ex explainability to be about explaining a complicated concept and teaching humans. And I think that in a large, to a large degree, predictive maintenance today is actually approaching this third bullet 
but we don't quite know what, what to do with it. Still, let, let's start from the, from the top. And when we talk about the AI being weaker than humans, we mostly talk about explainability as a debugging tool. So again, coming back to the really well-known cases, we have this saliency map which can show you which parts of the image the AI model is focusing. And you can figure out, okay, why is the model misclassifying this husky as a wolf? It's because the wolves are typically presented in snow, huskies are not. So the model has actually learned the wrong thing. And it sounds great, except it's not anything new. If we go back to like 80s, when we started the developing uh, neural network systems, we've had exactly the same cases. We had a uh, uh, tank identification example when had 100% success in the lab, and then was no better than random guess in reality. And it basically boiled down to the same thing. You would have uh, data which is biased, which is not really representative. So the model would learn, in this case, cloudy day versus sunny day, not tank versus trees. And of course, we are making progress here. I mean, Saliency map from five years ago was a big progress in this area. We are moving ahead even farther away. The Saliency map focuses on pixel level, which is a little bit tricky. If we think about something like, like a zebra, like if we ask ourselves about, okay, so what makes a zebra? Obviously, it's not any single pixel. It's the concept of stripes. So how can we make a network which will tell us which concepts are important for the predictions, not just which pixels? And then how would you learn those kind of concepts and so on? So that's kind of the direction of, of research today. And if we do that kind of stuff, you will see that you actually can find a lot of interesting parts. When you look at the fire engine and the concept of redness, you can see it's important for recognizing fire engines. And that's great that that seems natural, but it's good to know because then if you go to Australia, if your self-driving car is supposed to operate in Australia, it's good to know that you need to figure out some way of handling it because fire engines are not always red, they can be in other colors. And similarly, if you look at recognizing uh, rugby ball versus ping pong ball, it's important to know that your model is actually focusing not only on the ball, but also on the players. Uh, and that's, that's something that it takes, takes into account. But when we forget about just the debugging thing, and then we actually talk about how can we learn from humans, that's definitely the future. And we have some examples of, of cases where it worked. I mean, the AlphaGo is probably the best example. Uh, if we look at the move 37, that's, that was clearly described as not a human move. It was something very, very new. Uh, and today, the, the world of playing Go is very different because of this new strategy that was done. And if we think about the more practical examples like predictive maintenance, Today, if we talk specifically about predicting faults, AI is mostly better than human experts in basically almost all cases, provided that you have reasonable data. Predicting faults will be done by AI better. But predictive maintenance is much more than just predicting faults. It's also about kind of looking at this bigger picture. And when you start talking about, okay, so why is this problem happening? How can it be mitigated? what really should be the maintenance plan, how to balance the needs of the customer, the needs of the technician, and so on, that's way beyond capabilities of AI. So for that, you need to have this setup where AI and human experts are working together. And especially if you talk about designing better equipment in the future, you need AI and humans working together. And that's a very interesting direction that we are now starting to approach, but we don't really have all the solutions yet. So thank you very much. That's more or less what uh, I wanted to talk about. OK, thank you, Slavomir. This is very useful presentation because actually during recent times, a little bit earlier also, I have been uh, been a little bit in trouble explaining AI. And now you have done this kind of presentation that I will use a lot. <laughs> so. So this is very, very positive, at least for me, to, to have this kind of examples, how to explain the AI and where it suits. Uh, maybe we are now going into the 
Q&A question straight away. Are we sharing? We should go. Yeah, okay. So, okay, so, but maybe I start with, uh, we have a nice bunch of questions coming in, but uh, maybe I start with the warm-up question for Slavomir because he seems to be becoming my go-to guy in these difficult questions. And uh, uh, I was thinking because it's such a nicely, the two speakers, you guys, uh, one is a senior data scientist and another one is a lead AI scientist. So, so maybe I would like to understand a little bit, uh, how do you see the difference between these two? And maybe this is more question now first with uh, Slavomir, uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, because you are AI scientist. So how would you say, what's the difference with the, with the AI scientist and, uh, and the data scientist? So it's obviously a pretty tricky question. And uh, I think not everybody will agree with the same answer. Right? People understand those terms differently. And some people will say that there is no difference. Some people will say that uh, one is better than the other, but I, I don't quite think that's the case. What, what I'm, kind of my perspective on that is that the, Typically, when you talk about data scientists in uh, in companies, you, you talk about people who very well understand the data and the business side, as well as the uh, kind of more technical AI, machine learning, methodological side. Uh, and I think when we talk about AI scientists, especially in context of, of something like Silo, we talk more about people who are kind of cross domain or cross discipline sense of uh, we can work with uh, automotive data, we can work with healthcare data, we can work with energy data, because we, we are being kind of trying to apply the same techniques across many different areas. So we don't have the same uh, understanding of each particular kind of type of data and, and how it relates to the business, because that comes from our customers, but uh, we focus more on the kind of breadth of the methodological uh, solutions so that we can find the right solution for the right task. That, that would be my answer. Okay, that's a good answer. Maybe we go into those questions now that uh, uh, the webinar viewers have sent us. And, and now first one of these comes to Anna. Uh, and, uh, and of course, just to mention that uh, there were a lot of good questions, but uh, not, not all of can be answered uh, publicly. So, so we, we picked up uh, only those that uh, are, are possible to answer in this format. So the question is, how have you organized for driving, driving the change? Well, that's, that's a very good question. And uh, I cannot claim to have organized for any of that myself, but at the Cargotech group and the group level, actually we have, uh, digital transformation uh, team and uh, we have also a change management expert working in-house. Um, so we are very much supported by our colleagues and the other teams. Uh, personally, uh, what I have found helpful has been founding a community of practice, which uh, we did with a colleague from Kalmar when I was still new at Cargotech. We called or the, the community is called the data enthusiasts, and that's for uh, anybody being interested in data within the entire group, uh, being able to connect and share. So, okay, um, yeah, okay. So the next question uh, is for Slavomir and uh, it says, I agree that the analytics is a change management topic, and I'm curious on how you have succeeded in getting groups to work with one another and agree on how to move forward together. Is this change being driven by a single organization, i.e. digital office within your organization? So to be honest, and that may be a sad answer, I've never seen neither digital office nor innovation office nor any of those things actually drive any change uh, at least not okay. positive change uh, so so that that i'm a little bit skeptical about how, how it really can work 
what what I've actually found, and again, that might be my personal experiences, given that I'm mostly coming from uh, external companies like Silo or Academia, is having the external actor come in is a very, very big help. I've been working a lot with Bolzlo Group, for example, and it was a lot easier for somebody from academia to connect different groups than it was for the groups internally, uh, because we don't have to worry about all the same kind of internal politics and so on. Uh, and we can much clear, more clearly demonstrate the benefits of kind of working together and making sure things are done and so on. So again, as sad as it is, uh, it's definitely not easy. Yeah, I think you raised a very good point over there. And I, I have to say the same from my own experience. Uh, for Silo AI, I was working in a Finnish uh, company called Caston, which uh, is a machinery company. And, and there I, I did see the same, that the, when an uh, outsider comes, for instance, from university, it, it helps to think about things new way. And it was surprising what kind of nice things we able to do because of that. That's a very, very good race. Okay, the next question for Hanna is that, uh, and what have been your learnings on approaches or tools or techniques to use in change management? Um, I think in my personal experience, the tools have been of secondary importance. Um, perhaps the ma major thing is staying positive, um, showing people that you are interested in connecting with them, um, letting people know that what would make you happy is to help them solve for their problems. So I think these a positive attitude is is perhaps the the greatest uh, tool for change management. Sounds 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 very reasonable. <laughs> sounds sounds very good. <laughs> I think you understood quite a lot. Uh, I have another question here, Hanna, for you. Who defines the problems uh, or issues that the data science team solves? Well, that's another good question. Um, of course, mainly our our we want to to build uh, solutions that give additional value to our customers, and we do get quite a bit of input from our customer facing colleagues and and suggestions on on topics that would make our customers' lives a little bit easier and reduce their headaches and then, of course, we align align this internally with all of the relevant stakeholders. Okay, we we only have two minutes left. Uh, I think that uh, we we need to we need to close here on the Q and A session. But uh, I just have to say that it seems that at the end of the webinar we have received tens and tens of questions so it came a little bit late but there's a plenty of those so thank you for that so so you definitely have been listening it's it has been a great webinar so now the final slide before we say thank you just want to remind that uh, this was the first of this year's and there's plenty of good webinars coming next one is uh, on end of march on mlops very interesting topic and, and after that there will be webinar on autonomous vehicles uh, should be some sometime in may and then if you're interested in predictive maintenance uh, and and you but you're not 100 percent sure how to kind of machine learning suits you or, or what does it really mean uh, there's a one option is to take part in this predictive maintenance accelerator program that finland's ai accelerator fire is organizing right now so so please check that it's a very good way of getting getting on speed on machine learning and the predictive maintenance so for that i want to thank you all especially our great speakers who have been 
really marvelous. Thank you. And uh, I want to, of course, thank, thank all the webinars, watchers. But uh, I want to also thank Paulina, who's behind the scenes, our super communications lady, taking care of the things happening smoothly here. So thank you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.